Welcome back to our All Sound Case of the Month series for July 2022. As always, feel free to comment below and I'll attempt to address any questions or concerns. This case is unique because it comes all the way from California. The case was seen by one of our previous amazing chief residents, Dr. Hallie Brown, who is now completing her critical care fellowship. After the case, she texted me a few of the images, and based on our discussion, I thought it would make a great ultrasound case of the month. The case starts with a 55-year-old male presenting to the emergency department. Family was concerned about progressive decline over the past week, with specific concerns about anorexia, fatigue, and confusion. His only known medical history upon presentation was diabetes and hypertension. On physical exam, he was altered with slight agitation and was known to have severely dry mucosal membranes. His ED workup was remarkable for multiple laboratory derangements. Feel free to pause and review the laboratory values now. Additionally, he did receive a head CT showing evidence of an acute to subacute stroke. Given the patient's critical illness with some of his diagnoses listed here, he was consulted to the ICU where Dr. Brown and her team became involved in the patient's care. The patient was admitted to the unit overnight with multiple interventions initiated given his multitude of abnormalities. A large degree of his management focused upon fluid resuscitation and insulin given his profound hyperglycemia causing multiple metabolic derangements. After initiation of therapies, there was concern that the patient did not respond appropriately and he was found to be worse on reassessment with a progressive increase in his heart rate to the 140s, an increased work of breathing, and clinical hypoperfusion. These changes led the treatment team to perform a bedside echo looking for a potential etiology. Here is the first image obtained at bedside. If you have any echo experience, you can clearly tell this image is abnormal. This is a parasternal long axis view of the heart utilizing a cardiac preset. The probe indicator is on the right hand side of the screen. Please attempt to interpret the imaging before I discuss the findings in more depth. The first thing I noticed when looking at this image was the profound reduction in the left ventricular ejection fraction with dilation of the left ventricular cavity. The left ventricular chamber barely decreases in size with systole, the myocardium does not thicken with contraction, and the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve comes nowhere close to the interventricular septum. While the peristernal long axis view provides a good initial insight into the patient's cardiac function, another view is obtained. An apical four-chamber view is visualized next, which once again shows a severe reduction in global cardiac function. While we don't see the right ventricular free wall well, there is a suspicion for right ventricular dilation and reduced right ventricular function. Additionally, a rare and unexpected finding was noted. A large mobile echogenic mass was visualized in the right atria. This is a rare finding that represents a clot in transit. The final image reviewed was when color flow was applied to the apical four-chamber view. Color flow was applied looking for evidence for regurgitation. Classification of regurgitation can be complex with advanced measures sometimes being utilized, yet even without utilizing these measures, there appears to be moderate tricuspid regurgitation, farther supporting evidence of right heart dysfunction. Based upon these images, a more complex process was identified in what was already a critically ill patient. The bedside echo was able to identify a clear reduction in left ventricular ejection fraction, right heart dilation, and even though not formally measured, a suspected reduction in tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion based on gross visual estimation, which is often utilized as a marker of right ventricular function. If all that was not enough, there was identification of a clot in transit. The right heart dysfunction and identified clot in transit nearly certainly confirms the diagnosis of a pulmonary embolism, which likely contributed to clinical decompensation in an already critically ill patient. With this new information, his treatment strategy was altered to take his heart failure and clot and transit pathology into consideration. Multiple services were consulted to help assist in the patient's care, even with aggressive management and excellent care provided by his team, along with complexities beyond the focus of this case, the patient ultimately died from his illness after prolonged hospitalization. This was an extremely tough case because the patient had a multitude of processes in place resulting in multi-system organ failure. Ultrasound was utilized to provide essential information when the patient's clinical status changed and he was too sick to travel for definitive advanced imaging studies. The case provided more than a few learning points. The first being a chance to review an assessment of cardiac function. Assessing left ventricular ejection fraction can become quite complex with a multitude of techniques and advanced measurements. These advanced measures are often not employed by the vast majority of point-of-care ultrasound utilizers, and I would argue that the majority of initial clinical management decisions can be assisted with a simple visual estimation of ejection fraction, which has been proven just as good as more complex calculations. This ability to provide a gross estimation comes with experience of looking at numerous echo images, yet it can be assisted by asking three simple questions. 
Is the ventricle contracting symmetrically towards its center with a decrease in chamber size? Is the myocardium thickening as it shortens? And is the mitral valve opening normally, meaning is it coming close if not touching the interventricular septum? Our case can provide an example of this gross estimation with our patient's echo compared to a normal echo on a healthy patient. The normal heart on the right is displayed in a point-of-care preset with the pro marker on the left versus the cardiac preset with the marker on the right. This often confuses people new to heart ultrasound interpretation. The anatomy is the same, yet the image is just flipped. Compared to our patient's abnormal echo, we see the image on the right display normal symmetric contraction of the left ventricle with the walls coming towards each other and the chamber size decreasing in systole. We see the myocardium thickening as it shortens. And finally, the anterior leaf of the mitral valve comes close, if not hits the interventricular septum. While we often focus on the left ventricle, this case displays the importance of at least a basic understanding of the right ventricle and its appearance on echo. I again compare our patient's image on the left to that of a normal heart on the right. The main finding that stands out is what appears to be enlargement of the right ventricle. The normal ratio is 0.6 to 1, yet our patient appears to display at least a 1 to 1 ratio of right to left ventricular size, which raises our suspicion for right heart strain and increased right-sided pressures. Additionally, there is suspected reduction in tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion, known as TAPSI, based on gross visual estimation. As the name suggests, this looks at the lateral free wall annular plane of the tricuspid valve. The right ventricle is unique compared to the left in that it contracts in a more longitudinal plane compared to the circumferential contraction of the left. The longitudinal contraction and the normal degree of movement of the tricuspid annulus can be seen in the image on the right, which can be compared to the incomplete view of the tricuspid annulus in our patient's image. The dilation, along with the suspected reduction in tapsy, in addition to the noted tricuspid regurgitation, clearly represents right ventricular dysfunction. The next learning point focuses upon the clot in transit. As the name suggests, this is clot identified as it travels from the periphery to the central circulation and represents a specific finding for an imminent pulmonary embolism. As you can imagine, studies have shown a poor prognosis when this is identified, and it represents a condition where emergent intervention should take place. Patient-specific factors determine management decisions regarding anticoagulation, thrombolysis, or embolectomy. And the final learning point, as I have hinted at earlier with this case, and what is a common theme with the ultrasound case of the month series, ultrasound provides immediate bedside information that informs management decisions. The echo images in this case were instrumental in pivoting to provide a change in care that appropriately mirrored the complex process. I tell my residents all the time that if something doesn't fit or doesn't make sense, then we need to re-examine the patient, obtain more information, or investigate farther. Ultrasound provides that opportunity to investigate farther in order to best treat the patient in front of us in a timely manner. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed the case. Don't hesitate to grab bedside ultrasound to help in patient assessment, especially when more information would be instrumental in management decisions. Thanks and feel free to comment below.